what, you know, I, I mentioned some of the, the idols of today, the Kelly Clarksons and our guy Sebastian. Right. I mean, you were been there, done that. Well, I, yeah, I could remember the first time here was 1960, Karian, and it was for Lee Gordon, and it was myself, the Everly Brothers, and a gentleman by the name of Crash Craddock. Crash Craddock, A song Craddock, called Boom yeah. Boom Baby. And we were working, I think at that time, the old Sydney Stadium, mm -hmm. and we could not get off the stage. Hmm. I mean, the band who was called Joy and the Joy Boys, yeah. they had to play the national anthem. Wow. So people would just stand. So, and the police here in Sydney formed like a wedge. Mm -hmm. So we would get in the middle of the wedge and to escort us out. It was, it was really hard, you know, getting off the stage. The pressure that we see a lot of teen idols, yeah. you know, we've seen the Lindsay Lohans, the Britney right. Spears. I mean, talented young women right. and guys, um, a lot of them die from drugs. I mean, that wasn't, you know, just sort of strictly uh, to this era, the Jimi Hendrix's, we lost Janis Joplin's, right. but that era, of 60s when you were bigger than Elvis what do you remember of the pressure actually I, I really didn't have any pressure Carrie Ann I mean I came from uh, a, a great family upbringing uh, I'm Italian my real name oh. is Roberto Luigi Ridarelli and uh, mom from and Philadelphia dad, right from South Philadelphia and uh, the upbringing was uh, very family oriented mm -hmm. you know there was a lot of respect a lot of warmth a lot of love in the family which kept me kind of balanced mm. and even my first manager a man by the name of Frankie Day whose real name was Francesco Cocchi and uh, they would never he would never let any of the teen magazines write something bad you know and to one point uh, a, a girl on one of the magazines says we have to get Bobby involved with the paternity suit and he says no way mm. no way you didn't want that kind of wow. publicity. But you look at this, hit after hit, fresh-faced. You know, the whole British invasion changed your career. Yes. Well, I could remember working in, uh, in the UK, and I was working with a girl by the name of Helen Shapiro. Mm. And she was kind of like the uh, Brenda Lee of the UK. Mm. She had a first hit at 15. Uh, yeah, she was very young, and we were on a bus. And in front of us was... Uh, either a limo or a Rolls Royce, and she said, they're the Beatles. Well, this was like 19, six, late 63, early 64. I got up, I was looking for cockroaches or something. <laughs> the, I, we didn't know what a beetle was. You know, I was looking, you know, in Italian, we call them chimages, <laughs> little bugs. And I'll be a son of a gun. They stopped, the bus stopped, and they all met me. And they knew who I, who I was, but I didn't know who they were. And then about a month later, Carrie Ann, there they were on the Ed Sullivan show hmm. back home in the States. And I said, I met those guys. Wow. And of course, the rest was history. Indeed. You know. Now, you were in Australia, as you said, 1962. And there's a song called Kissing Time, uh, which made us realize you actually knew a lot about Aussie locations. Have a look at this, Bobby. <laughs> They're kissing in Sydney, Perth and Brisbane, too. Well, it ain't Melbourne, back in a Waterloo. <laughs> well, that was my very first hit record, a song called Kissin' Time, mm -hmm. summer of 1959. And it started off in the States. They're kissing in Cleveland, Kansas City, too. And my manager came up with a great idea. He said, let's record Kissin' Time. Let's record it. They're kissing Australia way. And that's what we did. They're kissing in Sydney, Perth, and Brisbane, too. Well, and in Adelaide, <laughs> even in Waterloo. And it became a very big hit for me the second time over, the Australian version. Fantastic. Now, we, when we mentioned you were on the program, we got this fabulous email. Oh, really? I want to share with you Susan from Brisbane. Good morning, Susan. Um, I heard Bobby was on the show. My memories flooded back. She said, my mother took my friend's night to the airport to see him arrive in Brisbane. Wow. He was with Chubby Checker and Del Shannon. Uh, this is the confession. I stole Bobby's comb from his pocket. Susan! This is 1962. <laughs> I treasured that for years. It even had his hair in it. I married at 19 and I considered I was way too mature to keep it, so I gave it to somebody who I worked with. Wish I hadn't. 
obviously uh, a light fingered little thing because I also have an LP which a boy lent me and I kept. Susan, your life of crime. Um, she's now 61. Susan, I, I'm, I'm thinking, is in, in Brisbane still. Okay. Do, memories, people who have such wonderful fond memories. I got an, an email, something similar to that, back home. It was from a, a son, and he said, Bob, he says, my mother's going to be at the uh, show at the, at the, uh, uh, the Crown Casino in Melbourne. And she'll be sitting front row, mate. And she was a member of your fan club, and she still has the button <laughs> with Bob. So I saved the email. I brought it with me because I'm going to single her out. Oh. I have the name down there, and I'm going to say, is there such and such a lady here? And have her stand up and introduce her to the audience. Well, can we, can we do something special for Susan? Why not? Um, because you, you, let's put up some dates where, where you're touring, by the way, Wait. because uh, that, the, Palm, uh, the Palm Room in Melbourne is fabulous. But you're also in Brisbane at, uh, at Kedron and also down at Seagull. Correct. So uh, I'm assuming Susan is still in Brisbane. Um, maybe, would you be kind enough to organise, I'll have someone organise tickets for That'd her? That'd be fantastic. Ooh, Susan. We'll get a couple of those. So, Susan, we will um, tick tac with she you. Still has, or she still has the comb or she doesn't have no, the comb No, she anymore. gave the comb away and she wishes she hadn't. Yeah. It's my lucky comb. So. <laughs> it's when I had hair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Susan. And uh, we'll let you know when Susan's turning That'd up. That'd be wonderful, That'd be great fun. Bye Bye Birdie and Margaret. Wonderful. Memories of working with gorgeous Anne Margaret. Oh. Uh, Anne was absolutely wonderful. Uh, we, the director, a man by the name of George Sidney, uh, Anne and I both screen tested. You know, we weren't mm. there, you know, set for the parts. And we both screen tested. Hello, how are you? This, that. Tell a little bit about yourself. Sing a little song. Do a piece of, uh, of business from, you know, mm. a scene from the movie. Two weeks later, I got a call saying that I landed the part of Hugo Peabody. Well, Hugo, Hugo Peabody in the Broadway show had absolutely nothing to do. No singing, no dancing, not, uh, not even a line. And George Sidney saw how Anne and I, there was some kind of magic that he saw between Anne and myself, and the parts get, got bigger and bigger and bigger and oh, bigger wonderful. and bigger. Yeah, and, and Anne, to this day, she still calls. She was working a place called Valley Forge, Mm -hmm. uh, not too far where I live outside of Philadelphia and my wife who unfortunately passed away it'll be September the 15th that'll be four years uh, w uh, due to breast cancer and Anne came over the house because my wife was losing her hair and Anne showed her how she says what do you think I get up in the morning and I go like I put on a turban and she showed my wife how to you know wear a turban oh. it was really sweet a good Re person. really sweet yeah Another wonderful American character, uh, Dick Clark, um, and I, uh, we've got a wonderful piece, and he once asked you, if you could control your future, what would you like to happen? Have, have a look at this, Bobby. Well, Dick, I guess, uh, personally, for my mom and dad, I would like to buy them a home, which is something they always wanted. And for myself, uh, I would love to go into nightclubs and to become an actor bit of a time well, capsule. Yeah, really. I mean, I bought... Do you remember that? Yes, I do. He did that at my old house in South Philadelphia. Did you buy your mother a home? Yes. Oh, that, uh, matter of fact, I was in London, and my mom and my dad and my mom's parents, who came from the old country, my grandparents, they moved into the house November 22nd, 1963, the day that President Kennedy was assassinated. I think it was the 22nd or the 23rd, but that's the day they moved into the house. And now it's just my mom and myself. My mom's 90 years old, God bless her. And, uh, and you're living with your mother at home in yeah, Philadelphia. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, we, should, we always, it was my wife, myself, my children, my grandparents, my wow. dad. Now it's just mom and me. Everyone has mm. since moved on to a nicer place. Mm. Yeah. What a lovely story. Well, that's a real time capsule, because we're talking time capsules, where uh, the National Trust are asking people, what.